That was awesome, Philip. Great job. I'll give him one more round of applause. <laughs> All right, now for the real round of applause, let's give the Lord a round of applause. I am so thankful that God has sent people that are so talented to this to this church. It's, it's just amazing to me how how well God has provided in that aspect for such a small group. We're really, really, really blessed. All right, and the kids have got a basket of fruit there. Well. Now, if you if you will go ahead and uh, start finding in your Bibles uh, the, in the Book of Revelation, we're going to be in in uh, chapter eleven today. I love that song, by the way, Philip. It, it's it is one of my favorite songs because there's so much theology inside of that song. It's, it is uh, it is awesome. My, my my favorite part in the song is the "From Age to Age He Stands." I, I absolutely love that lyric that's in there because we've got a God that's going to stand from age to age. It's not bound by anything. And what we're preaching on today is, a, is an age that's to come after the age that we live in currently. And my God, and if He be your God too, He'll reign in that age just as He does in this one. So you've got your Bibles. We're going to be in, in Revelation chapter 11. If you, uh, if you got, if you'd stand, and we'll honor the reading of the Word of God. And there was given me a reed, like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar in them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I'll give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed." These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn the blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the, of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt." where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and, a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet." And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to the heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was past, and behold, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, Kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that feared thy name, shall uh, small and great, and should and shouldest and shouldest destroy them 
which destroyed the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in the temple of the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and great hail. Father God, Lord, we come to you, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name above all names, God. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, for the reading and the hearing of your word, Lord. Lord, I pray that if there be one under the sound of my voice today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, that they'll, they'll quickly make the decision to come to know and love you, Lord. Lord, and we'll be careful to give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So I want to ask you a question today. And that question is, is something that I, I've... I've asked myself plenty of times. I, I, know, I know the answer for myself, and I want to ask you the question, are you being persecuted for Jesus Christ? Are you, not mama and daddy, not grandma and grandpa, not aunts and uncles, not, not your preacher, are you being persecuted for Jesus Christ? Now the question is not, are you being persecuted? The question is, are you being persecuted for Jesus Christ? And if not, then why not? The reason why some are persecuted and others are not can be found in, the, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 12. The Word of God reads this way, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If we're living a godly life, through Jesus Christ, then we are going to suffer. It is not a bed of roses to be a Christian. To, to be a Christian. You know, in eternity, it is a great thing. But in the meantime, while you're inside of this capsule of time, it is not a bed of roses. I, I can't find anywhere. I can't find anywhere in the text where it would say you don't suffer. But I can show you several instances where you will suffer if you're living godly in Christ Jesus. You ever, you ever know about those people, you know, they, they, they live like heathens and nothing seems to go wrong for them. And if you're living a, a godly life and you're doing, doing your very best, it seems from, from time to time you, you can't get ahead. It's, 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 you can't tell if it's, the, if it's the devil holding you back. You can't tell if it's God holding you back. The truth of the matter is, when we are in tune with God, we will be persecuted. And it's a, it's a telltale sign, actually. We, we actually need to, to look at this sign as a, as a key that you, you very well could be living right if you're being persecuted. I, I can think back to, to the times in my own life and in my own ministry where persecution just seemed endless. And every day I would, I would question God. And you say, oh, don't question God. Well, let me tell you, these disciples, they question God. I can show you over and over where they question Jesus Christ straight to His face. I question God all the time. Well, God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Why? I'm, I'm, I'm being pretty good, God. I'm in Your Word. I'm... I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving all I can give to it hurts, Lord. I, I know I'm saved. I'm blood-bought. I'm born again. Every, everything, I'm, I'm giving it all to you. And I'm still facing, facing this persecution. I, God, show me what I'm doing wrong. And there never really was an answer. I don't believe there was any wrong in that aspect there. I believe this was a sign of doing right. This is a sign of, of standing up, standing on the Word of God firmly, unshakable, and feeling the pressure that comes along with that. And I, I just want to praise God for a moment that He has won, He has fought and won those victories for us. There, I, 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 look, I look back on, on different pressures and all I can do is thank God for it because it prepared me along the way for different things that would happen. And, and this was, this was a, a good type of persecution. And the reason it was good is because God said it would happen. And it was a telltale sign of, of, of living right. It was a telltale sign of, of being sold out for Jesus and facing the persecution. Now, I want to say this. We, we live in a time where persecution has changed a little bit. 
you know, when you, when you sit there and think, you, 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 you look back at, at the disciples, you look back at the martyrs that have gone before us, you look back at, at the, the, the Stevens, and you look back at the, the Polycarps, and, you, and you, you think about these guys, these guys that, that went to their death. You look at the, the missionaries that were beheaded and burned alive, and you, and you think, well, now that's persecution. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I, I want you to think for a moment. Who, who in here just it suffers from just anxiety real quick? you suffer from anxiety, anybody? I do. I have, believe it or not, I've, I've told you all this. You all may not believe it, but I have stage fright. I'm terrified to get up here to talk. Really, I can talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm scared to death every time I get up here. I'm not just sweating because I'm fat. I'm sweating because I don't like being up and talking in front of people. I have anxiety about things. And I, I, have, I have anxiety about the, the way that I'm treated and especially how people treat my wife who has, has severe anxiety. And I'm going to tell you what. Brittany Potoff would rather die than be publicly humiliated. I can vouch for that. She would rather die than be publicly humiliated. I, I've, been in, I've been in that scenario. I've been publicly humiliated. I've had people challenge my, uh, my, my, uh, my character. And your, your Christian character just has, to, it just has to stand strong in those times. But I'm going to tell you what, persecution isn't always being beheaded, being lit, being lit on fire. There's people out there that would rather have that than be publicly humiliated because of their faith. One thing I, I got to... I got to give Brittany credit where, where credit's due. Uh, she is a little more vocal on things like social media than I am. I've just learned to keep my nose out of out of out of social media and and, and not and not deal with with the garbage that comes with it and just fight battles that are in front of me right now. But Br Brittany is constantly attacked on social media for, for, for standing up for her Christian values. And, and I've, got, I've got to applaud my wife. Because and, 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 it is difficult for her to have family, especially family, say things like, your beliefs are stupid or, or things like that. I mean, she's publicly hu humiliated and she would rather just die. I, I can tell you that. Y'all know Brittany. She, she, it's hard to get a word out of her unless you've known her for, for six years. But she just started talking to me. We've been married for nine, Kelly. I mean, you think you laugh, but we, we just we, I just got her to talk a little bit. Um, but this persecution, it's not changed, but it has, it has been added to. There's new ways. Yes, you can still die for your faith. Yes, you can be publicly humiliated. For your faith back back then, I I got to give the disciples credit. If they if they were publicly uh, humiliated, they could have just went to another town, and they probably would have got publicly humiliated there. They might have got stoned, like you know, like your your Stevens and your Pauls. I mean, it, it, this could have this could happen. They could have at any time just picked up and walked away. But right now, with the digital footprint, you put it on social media, and everybody attacks you. Anna, isn't it right? You don't like that feeling with with especially people in that liberal college that you go to. You, I mean, it's hard to stand up for your faith because a fear of public persecution. But if you're living right, you're going to be persecuted. Isaiah 54 and 17, the Word of God says this, no weapon, that means Facebook too, that means, that means blades, that means fire, that means nooses, that means electric chairs, that means guns. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Revelation 11, 1 and 2, the Word of God reads this way. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now this holy city in the scriptures is Jerusalem. And the period of time is being talked about here is the great tribulation. And we're in a part where there's some amazing end time prophecies. And I want to tell you this, just in case you didn't know, but some of these prophecies have already been fulfilled. This one in particular, God said that He would regather the people of Israel. That's well on its way, if not complete. 
and bring them back to their land. Ezekiel 36 and 24 says, For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Other prophecies have yet to be fulfilled, but the temple, it will be rebuilt. It's just a matter of time now. Revelation 11 and 1 says, And there was a giving, and, and there was giving me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and then that worship them. There's a reason they were told to measure it. So they would know the dimensions when they rebuilt this thing. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty clear to me. But right where that temple was right now, there stands a, a, a mosque, the Dome of the Rock, standing there today. But Jesus, he prophesied the destruction of the temple in his day. Matthew 24 and 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Think about this. This temple destroyed completely. Not one stone left upon another. There's some some unique things that happened here to get it that way. I know y'all uh, y'all probably watched them tearing down the old uh, bojangles up there, and they bring in the the excavators and the <clears throat> and the the backhoes and the they knock the building down and and you know they leave us a big old dirt clay pit for a while. This is done by hand here. Not one stone would be would remain here. Uh, not one stone here upon another. Let me tell you what happened here. One, it it wasn't long after after this that uh, a Roman general named Titus he came in. He laid siege to Jerusalem. He destroyed it. The temple was, was burned. There was gold in the temple. This fire got so hot that the gold in the temple melts down and gets into the crevices under the stone, the flooring of the temple. So guess what? These people, they might be some descendants of some that live here in Buford. They got to that gold. They dug those stones up and they got to that gold to get it out. When the Bible says that no stone will be left upon another, it's because the people got in there, they dug it out, and they got the gold. What a dang on prophecy right there. That's just, that's just amazing. Who would have thought that this gold was going to melt down into these stones and give people a reason to destroy something that was so holy for them at the time? Now think, think about that for a moment. Now the religious Jews that are out there today, you can go, you can go online and you can, you can Google right now, rebuilding the temple. And there are groups planning it. There are groups trying to get it financed as we speak. I spent some time doing that today to see, to see about these, these groups that are out there that are, that are existing right now in the day that we live in. And I'm not saying that it's going to be one of these groups that does the building. But it's going to happen. The, the plan is in motion. God told John in Revelation 1-1 to measure the temple because it's going to be rebuilt. Now, the temple being rebuilt, it's a precursor to the Antichrist and his power. Jesus said that the Antichrist will enter the temple and will make it desolate. Matthew 24, 15 and 16 says... When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoke of by Daniel, by the way, if you're taking notes, that's Daniel chapter 9, by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in, in Judah flee into the mountains. Matthew 24 and 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. The Apostle Paul also spoke of this happening. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-5. through 5. The Word of God reads this way. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us 
as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." Whoso exposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So Paul's telling us what the really the the final sign is going to be there. The building the building of this reconstruction of this temple is going to be one of the most amazing times. And don't be surprised that if in your lifetime you don't see it trying to get rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed. Don't be surprised about that. I'm not going to be surprised at all if I see that in my lifetime. But I'm, that I'm, it won't, this temple though, this temple this is speaking of what will happen during the great tribulation here. But don't be surprised because the plan's in action. It's been in action the entire time. Ever since it was, was God-breathed, it was nothing but history that hadn't taken place yet. There's coming a day when the temple is going to be rebuilt. There's coming a day when a world leader will establish himself in the temple in the holy place and proclaim himself to be God. This will be the man of sin. This will be the abomination of desolation. This will occur right in the middle of the seven-year period of the Great Tribulation. God's given us warning of what will happen, and God will send His messengers. He's going to send two mighty prophets. The two witnesses will rise up during these terrible events, and they'll prophesy, and they'll teach. I'll tell you something about God. He always sends a prophet. Always. Amos 3 and 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but He revealeth His secret unto His servants, the prophets. Before the flood, before Noah's flood, God sent Enoch and Noah to warn people as prophets. He sent Elijah and Jeremiah before the exile. And we're being warned today. Not only have we had the prophets, but we've got God's Word. Revelation 11 shows us a few things concerning the prophets today. Now, I want to be clear that, that we are not these two prophets. Now, I want, I want to be clear that if you, don't, if you don't hear anything I ever say, this is God's Word. This is not God's Word about you. This is not God's Word about me. This is God's Word about His Son. You are not a David. You are not a Jeremiah. You are not a Moses. This book is not about you, but it is awful helpful to you. Okay? I want you to, I want you to forget everything you've ever heard in America about facing your giants because you're not David. The point of that wasn't for you to face your giants. The point of that was for you to trust God like David did, not to go out and get yourself a slingshot. That wasn't the point of that. You are not these prophets, but we can learn from these prophets. I want you to, I want you to know that. Revelation 3 and 4, we, we get to see how they're spiritually prepared. And I'll give power unto my two witnesses... And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, the men that are described here as olive trees and candlesticks. Candlestick speaks of light. Olive tree speaks of fruitfulness. You've got this description should be of not just these two witnesses, but if you're a witness for Jesus Christ, you should have these characteristics. You should, you should carry His light. You should be fruitful. and You should bear good fruit and the light of God. The word candlestick is also translated to the word lampstand. Um, 
the lampstands in the temple, I want you to think about these, these lampstands, they burned with oil from the inside of them, or oil if you're from up north. And oil in the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. We're to be like this lampstand. We're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Our light is to shine because of the oil that's inside of us. Matthew 5 and 14 says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And I want to tell you something today about letting the Holy Spirit be the oil that ignites you. Do you know if you, um, if you light a, a lantern it'll, without oil inside of it, what will happen? It will burn for a few moments until it burns the wick out. That oil is what burns. That oil is what provides light, not the wick. You want to make sure you're burning oil, not burning the wick, because you, you'll, get, uh, you'll get yourself caught up in a, in a uh, some pretty rough situation there trying to manufacture what only the Holy Spirit can do. Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto, both, unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the othermost part of the earth. It is absolutely foolish. It is absolutely wicked and terrible and horrible and evil of you or I or anyone else to ever try to manufacture the work of the Holy Spirit. It, it is abominable to do that. It, it is abominable to, to try to do work in the name of God without being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's terrible. That is, it's foolish. And I, I, think, I think for a moment about, about um, people that, and their, their works-based religions. I'm telling you, you can't sling a dead cat around here without, without it hitting somebody that's involved in works-based religion. You just can't do it. They're burning the wick and not the oil. It's a counterfeit. So it's trying to counterfeit the Holy Ghost. Revelation 11.3, it tells us these men are clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a dull garment. Anybody ever crop backer before? If you're from up north, that means harvested tobacco um, by hand. But <laughs> growing up, you crop backer and you, you would take it out of the barn and you would throw it inside of a, a burlap sheet and you tie it up. Well, that's what, pretty well what sackcloth is. It's a burlap. A lot of women like to buy it at Hobby Lobby and make decorations with it. This is what these guys were clothed in. Now, I don't know about you, but being clothed in, in burlap, being clothed in sackcloth, doesn't, um, doesn't seem that, that appealing to me anyway. And it, see, it sounds like it would itch. It probably wouldn't be as hot as this suit jacket, but I believe you'd, I believe you'd be pretty warm in that. I, I believe it would be, uh, be uh, just a rough clothing. But I'm, I'm going to tell you why they were clothed in this sackcloth. Because they could mess these things up. They could get down low and dirty, praying to God. And... Out in, out in the street preaching. These, these witnesses, they were coming to preach judgment. All right? They were coming in, in a spirit of mourning for the people that they'd be preaching to. So, so they're, they're clothing the sackcloth. It, it symbolizes mourning to us. And they would preach judgment to, to those with the I mean, they were brokenhearted. I mean, you know, you ever you ever mourn anybody and just be flat out brokenhearted? They they would they would preach brokenheartedly to these multitudes. And you think about it, the multitudes; they'd be marching to hell in this time period by the battalions. I mean, the hundreds and thousands just going to hell, and they're preaching this judgment to them. And I want you to think for a moment about these about these these clothes and. And how they were, and, and the Bible specifically tells us for a reason, because of the type of, of preaching they were doing here, this judgment preaching. You know, when you mourn somebody, we just went to a funeral yesterday. By the way, I, this is what I wore. Um, I don't have all the 
money in the world to be buying all kinds of fancy clothes. I wear the same thing two days in a row, and we'll just have to deal with that. But when you're in mourning, you know, you may go to a funeral and dress up nice, but I'm, you ever mourn somebody, and as soon as you get home from that funeral, celebrating, sending them home, you got to get in those pajamas and mourn and cry, bury your head in that pillow. I mean, this is the type of mourning, but they didn't have time. They don't have time here to bury their head in pillow. They've got to stand up and they're preaching this judgment. And when when we're we're carrying this this message of of judgment. And, and preaching, we got to remember this is a this is a sorrowful, broken-hearted message here, especially during this time period that we're talking about here. But in the same way, these two witnesses will be preaching judgment. When we're witnessing to the lost, knowing that they're lost, it's a state of mourning for them. Now, when they come when they come into the fold, when they're saved, man, that's what a joyful occasion that is. But you can't have one without the other. You can't preach judgment without preaching grace or, other, or else you're preaching a lie. Now that's inside the church age. These guys, they're preaching judgment. They're not in the church age any longer. Let's go on. And they're also sovereignly protected. And I want you to know that you are too. I asked you earlier if you've been persecuted for your faith. And if you haven't, why not? Pay attention here because these guys are sovereignly protected and so are you and so am I. Revelation 11, 5 and 6, And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood. Enter smite, uh, uh, enter smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now, fire in this passage, it speaks of, of, of power. Uh, the Bible speaks of Jesus having a, a sharp two-edged sword that, that goes out of His mouth when He comes again. And this is symbolic of the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. we got this mighty weapon here inside of this Word of God, first off. Um, the word power here, page, I'm going to give you some scripture here. The word power, it speaks of authority. Luke 10 and 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you to go out there and pick up snakes like some of them humdingers out there do. I'm telling you what the Word of God says here. Behold, I give you power. To tread on serpents and scorpions and all over and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So these, these men they, they have power. The witnesses they have it. They have power over death, plagues, droughts, disease. These men are, remind us a whole lot of Elijah and Moses. And many believe they'll come in the spirit of Elijah and Moses. When we think of Elijah. We think of the prophets. When we think of Moses, we think of the law. But these two witnesses, they'll come, and they'll represent the law, and they'll represent the prophets to us. The purpose of both, the law and the prophets, were to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 24 and 27 says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them, and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. This is one of my favorite verses. He's telling you that everything inside of this word has to do with Jesus Christ and not Robert Podoff. It also tells me that, uh, that Jesus Christ was an expository preacher. Right? If, I look, if I look at it right here, he expounded on to them and all the scriptures. If the preacher's going to be Christ like, I believe there's only one way to do it to ex be an expository preacher. Preacher of the Word of God. I don't want you ever to make the mistake that the Jews have made thinking that the Old Testament is about Judaism. And I don't want you ever to make the mistake that these New Age Christians have made in thinking that the New Testament is about Jesus and not the Old Testament. All of the Bible is about Jesus. These two witnesses, they'll come and they'll, they'll be representing all that is in the Bible. 
and they'll testify of Jesus Christ. And I say, I say all that to tell you this, to, to, get, to get to this point. Remember, they, these witnesses, they have this power. People are going to come. They're going to try to kill them in this time period. They're going to fail. They're going to fail miserably because they are sovereignly protected. The person of God that's in God's will, that's speaking God's word, I want you to hear what I'm saying here. This is going to, this is going to sound funny for Facebook. If you're in God's will and God's timing, you might as well consider yourself immortal. You might as well. God has His hand to protect His children in that time period until He's finished with you here on earth. Until God is finished with you, you are immortal. Nothing can stop you as long as you're in God's will. Not a thing. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't stand up and preach the Word of God if somebody get upset, come in the church and shoot you. It doesn't mean that. But when that time comes, that's when you'll stop being immortal. And that's when you'll go into real immortality in eternity. But if you're doing God's will the same way that these prophets are, consider yourself immortal. Nothing can stop you. My Bible says there's no weapon formed against us. It, it, it says, no weapon formed against uh, these shall prosper. Hear what I'm not saying. There's consequences to everything you do. You could die. But in that moment, consider yourself immortal because you are protected by a sovereign God that loves you. That may be strange to hear, but it is what it is. Nobody's going to take you out of this, out of this earth until God is ready for you to come home. And we don't know when that is. And we don't know how we're going to go. But if you're going to go, go preaching God's Word, preaching His message, the victory's won. Whether somebody comes in here and shoots you in the head or not, the victory is won. Think about that. And if they come in and they shoot me, y'all pray for Brittany, don't worry about me, because I'm with God. In that, in that sentence, just take care of my family. That's all I've got to say about that. These witnesses are also satanically persecuted. Revelation 11, 7 through 10. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they dwell upon the earth, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall sing gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. <coughs> the beast mentioned here in this passage, he's the Antichrist. The same one that's going to sit in the temple and proclaim to be God. He's described as ascending out of the abyss. Jerusalem is described as a hellish city. It's compared to Sodom and Egypt. Now, it's compared to Sodom with all of its vices and, and sin. And it's compared to Egypt with all of its vanity. Any anyway, Egyptians are some funny people. You talk about some vain people. You know they they shave all the hair off of their bodies, even their eyebrows, because they believe hair is nasty. That's some strange stuff. That's some that's some real vanity right there. That's and then you got Sodom with everything that was going on in Sodom, and now Jerusalem being compared to Sodom and to Egypt. You think it's bad in the world now with everything that you know that's, that's publicly going on now and the, the, the pronouns and the, the, all that garbage and, and filth that's out there and the, the other types of, of vices that are out there and the, the Christian liberalism which is not Christianity. 
This stuff is how they're just this fil- the, the changing of God's Word. The fil- we think it's bad now. Man, it's a cakewalk compared to what it's going to be right now with, with a, a place that's literally referred to as Sodom and as Egypt. Now, the fury of hell will bust, on, uh, bust out on these two witnesses here. All of hell is going to want to attack these men because these men are preaching the gospel. These, these, these two witnesses literally have been tormenting the demons and, and tormenting the lost by preaching the gospel. And now all the fury of hell comes out to, to attack them. And as we get closer and closer to this time, he grows darker and darker. People will be persecuted more and more for different things. And it's more and more intense. And hatred toward godly people, it just increases and intensifies. But this fury here, this is coming from the Antichrist himself. Revelation 11 and 7 says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now these two great witnesses, they're not going to die until they have finished the task that God has given them. That's when I'm talking about immortality. I'm not talking about no, no stupid um, Marvel comic gods or nothing like that. I'm talking about God has protected them up until this point. Until, and just the same way He will you, if you stand up for His Word, until the point He's ready to draw you home, consider yourself immortal there. Now, up until this point, there's nothing that could have happened to them. But now, at this, at this mark in time, they'll, they'll be finished, the task that God's given them to do. Paul also lived a life like this. 2 Timothy 4 and 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul was finished, and he knew he was finished when he wrote that. Uh, you can't tell me that Paul, wasn't ordered, uh, Paul wasn't divinely kept alive. You can't tell me that Paul didn't have a, a pretty good element of immortality to accomplish God's will. But when it was accomplished and his course was finished, Paul went to be with the Lord. And not just Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ, the same way. When he was crucified and, and he died before he did that, he claimed it is finished. John 19 and 30, when Jesus therefore uh, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, I know we're talking about God in the flesh here. They didn't take His life. He gave His life. They could not have taken His life if they wanted to. They couldn't have done it. Because God's will hadn't been finished yet. And until God's will in your life is finished, He's not going to take you out of here. But it's, it is awful scary to know, hey, standing in God's will, I might get taken out of here. He might use me to accomplish this task and pull me out. I think about Brittany's granddaddy with this. Donnie Beck should have died a long time ago. I, I can't tell you. He, he must have had some cat blood or something. That joker had more than nine lives, though. Since I've known, I've known him for about 10 years, and all 10 years, at first I was afraid to date Brittany because I was afraid, man, I'm going to have to deal with her grandpa dying right, real quick. Like, I, you know, I don't know if I want to get involved with somebody that's, fixing, that's right now fixing to have There's, He had no reason to walk around for another 10 years after I met him. None whatsoever. I mean, he was, he was a dead man walking. When, when I met him, he was, he was 600 pounds, Breathing on, on oxygen, could barely go. The day he walked Brittany down the aisle, it scared me to death. And we even practiced how we would catch him if he failed. That's just how close to death he was. And then he stayed sick for almost 10 years. And he, would, he asked me from, from time to time, and 
Now, Donnie was a, a he was a great Christian man. I'm, I'm going to tell you this. And if it, if not for him and his testimony, I probably never would have come to Christ. Um, and I sure never would have been preaching. I mean, you're talking about the guy that paid for me to go to seminary. And he says, why has God let me be like this? Because it, it did confuse him. And I was sitting and talking with him. I said, Donnie, I want you to think about this. You just said it. God let you be here. Yeah, you didn't get to really pick the terms on that, but God let you be here. God let him be here until he was able to finish his course. If God would have taken Donnie back 10 years ago, the, the odds of me being here just become so much more astronomical, it's not even funny. But God had a plan to use that man until he was finished with him, and then he took him on his turn. So in a lot of ways, that 10-year period, I don't believe anything, any power on earth could have done anything to Donnie because God wasn't done with him. And when he did call him home, it was a joyful occasion. It was, it was beautiful. When a child of God's mar martyred, whether they burnt in a cage, martyred on Facebook, beheaded, it doesn't mean that the devil's won. It means that he's lost. Revelation 12 and 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I'm so proud of Brittany when she gets tormented on when she gets tormented by her family on Facebook because she's she's given up that part of herself to be attacked. Those, those guys that were beheaded for their faith, burnt burnt alive for their faith, man, they love not their lives unto the death for Jesus Christ. Now, the killing of these two witnesses here, when when they go down, it's going to catapult the beast into great fame and popularity. He'll be seen as a, as a mighty because he was the one that got rid of these two tormentors. The bodies of these witnesses, they'll be left out in the streets of Jerusalem. And it's, it's coming. It's a, it's a good, deal, good deal closer than what you could imagine. I, I mean, I, we've got types and shadows of things that are out there now. I, I, want, I want to be clear with you. I do not believe under any circumstance, period, that um, this vaccine that's out there is the mark of the beast. I do not believe that. There, I've seen the mark of the beast be called everything in the, in the past 10 years. I've seen it be referred to as your social security number. I've seen it. I've seen it all. I don't believe that we've seen what the mark of the beast is actually going to be. I, I just I do not believe it. But I do believe that things like this vaccine are casting shadows for what's to come. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's, it's paving the way. I, I, want, I want you to just imagine uh, an asteroid coming to the earth that gets in the way of the sun. That asteroid eventually casts a shadow. That shadow is not the asteroid. It's just a sign of what's to come. It, it's a... It's letting you know it's almost here. We, 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 we've, we, can, we can see shadows and we can expect increasing persecution in that time period. But let, let me tell you about these, these guys here. They're, not only are they, they uh, satanically persecuted, but they're also supernaturally preserved. Revelation 11, 11 through 12. And after three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to the heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. God's going to raise these two witnesses to life. We don't have to fear persecution. As a saint of God, you do not have to fear persecution. Until, like I said, until God is ready to call you home, consider yourself immortal for His benefit. And when it stops benefiting Him, that's when He'll take you. We're preserved for a task. And God has Satan on a leash. 
the enemy may be able to put us to death. But we're still supernaturally preserved. Luke 21, verses 12 through 18. I'll try to read these quick and finish up quickly for you here. But before all these... They shall lay their hands on and persecute you, delivering you up into the synagogues, into the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and uh, I give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist, and you shall be betrayed. Uh, you shall be betrayed both parents and brethren, and kinfolks, and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair on your head perish. When we are persecuted for the, for the sake of God, it is the greatest platform that we could ever have. It's our, it's our greatest weapon. Matter of fact, your death, if you die in the will of God, is the most powerful weapon at your disposal. I want you to think about it like this. There was uh, this true story of some uh, of a missionary. He's been, he's out. Uh, I can't remember the location, but I, I remember the, de- the other details of the story here. He's out, and all he has to do to escape death is to denounce Jesus Christ, and he refuses to do it. And he sits now and. And he, 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 he's allowed some time in prayer. He starts praying and the guards in charge of him, they're like, I'm out of here. I'm not killing a man that's praying like that. It is done. I'm over. Other guards come in. They take him, they take him to the decision maker and he, he's sitting and he's talking with the decision maker and he says, all you've got to do is denounce Jesus Christ or I'm going to put you to death. And he tells him, go ahead and do it. You might as well. Because let me tell you what happens if, when you use your chief weapon. When you, your chief weapon is to kill me, my chief weapon is to die in the, name of the, in the name of my Lord and Savior. If you use your chief weapon, I'm forced to use mine. And what happens if I die for my faith and I'm willing to stand up for it, then you just might as well print it out in blood. You just stamped every single message I've ever preached in blood and you've made it that much more powerful. They let the joker go. He walked away. He walked away from that. They knew he was right. If he was willing to die for it, then he would sway people the other way. And praise God. They didn't want him to to use his greatest weapon there. His greatest weapon and your greatest weapon as a believer is to stand up and be willing to even die for your faith. Matthew 10 and 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is aboard to destroy both soul and body. Until we're no longer afraid to die, we're not really ready to live as a Christian. There's a God in glory. And there's nothing that the devil can ultimately do to us. Eternally speaking. But they also have, um, they've successfully prophesied here. We're, we're wrapping up here. Revelation 11, 13 and 14, And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The witnesses haven't failed. They've succeeded. Those who survived this great earthquake they'll give glory to God. Now, this doesn't mean that they're saved. This means that they're admitting that this was God. Uh, I want to give you some examples of that. Pharaoh had to acknowledge God during the plagues, but he wasn't saved. King Saul had to acknowledge God. The demons in hell will one day acknowledge God, though they will not be saved. Romans 14 and 11 says, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. These prophets, they, they've witnessed up until their death, and God received glory for that. 
when we witness somebody that doesn't receive Jesus, it's not a failure on our part. We're successful when we witness, regardless if they want to hear it, regardless if they accept it. As soul winners and preachers and teachers of the gospel, we're not responsible for if they take it or not. We're only responsible for what we do with it. Ezekiel 2, 5 and 7 says, And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house, and they shall, and they, thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. It's our responsibility to declare the Word of God, to declare Jesus Christ, no matter if people want to hear or not. Yesterday at that funeral, I know it was about half full of lost people. I mean, they were obviously lost people. They just so happened to be there because of the witness of one man that loved them dearly, and they attended his funeral. At that funeral, my instructions from him were to preach the gospel. Planning his funeral beforehand, when I'm talking to him, I sat and had some private time to talk with him. That if it failed, if the task fell to me, what do you want me to do, Donnie? And he says, "Well, you can spend the first part talking about me, the second part telling uh, telling him about Jesus, giving him the gospel. And a matter of fact, if you want to skip the first part, that's all right with me. Give him the gospel." Tell them about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Tell them about the cross of Calvary and how there's room for one more. Tell them that persecution will come. And that's not a bad thing, but a good thing. It gives us a good platform to speak from. Every one of you, if you live a Christ-centered, godly life, you're going to face persecution. As believers, we're on the winning side, though. Even when these end-time events occur, I wonder, do you know where you'll be in that period? I wonder about your relationship, whether you be in here or be through Facebook. What's your relationship like with Jesus Christ? Do you know Him personally? If not, you can pray to Jesus today. You can ask Him to come into your heart. You can ask Him to come into your life. You can ask Him to save you in the condition you're in. And you can live a life from victory, waiting on His return, or waiting on Him to call you home, whichever comes first. But if you know you're eternally secure, if you know your future is secure, you can really live life now. You can live life like you're immortal right now if you give your heart to Jesus Christ. Would you call on Him today? Would you repent of your sins? Would you, would you turn and ask Him to forgive you? Would you acknowledge Him as Lord of your life? If you'll do that today, He'll be quick to save you. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name above all names, God. Lord, if there be one that doesn't know You as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that they'll come quickly to know you, God, before it's everlasting too late. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.